So we're in our fourth week of a five-week series entitled Awakening. And uh, much has happened in the three weeks already. Um, and I'm excited to, to share with you this word this morning. Um, there's, a, there's a verse that we've kind of been using as the kind of foundation for this whole series. And it's Isaiah 43, 19. It says, I'm doing a new thing. Don't you see it? It's already begun. I'm, I'm providing a way. I'm making a way in the wilderness. I'm the river and the dry land. And here's one thing that we have to notice about awakening. Because it is a new thing, it will create a stir. When you bring new things into set systems in any aspect of life, we don't always like change, okay? But something new is happening. Awakening is happening, and it creates a stir. Here's the, the important part about today as we move in the, the progression of this series. Uh, we're going to kind of, so to speak, physically move as we go through this. Um, entitling of the message, Movers and Shakers. It's not enough to be awake, okay? There, there are times in life when you sit up out of bed and you're awake, but you don't want to move forward, all right? So awakening is about more than just being awake. It's time to get up and be movers and shakers. There are really two types of way that, I, I guess we could, we could go um, a lot of different places, but there are two different types of ways that the Lord was speaking to me about physically waking up. As I recall in my life, I was always a morning person. I enjoyed getting up, but the thing is, is for me to actually get up, I had to get moving. Right? Like, to actually be awake, I had to get up and start moving. Like, I was okay once my feet hit the floor. Some of you know what I'm talking about because that's you. Like, if you lay in bed, you're awake, but you're really not awake. But if you get up and start moving, then things start to happen. Let, let, me, let me ask you all this question. Are any of your kids hard to get up? <laughs> okay. That moves me into the second type. The shakers. Okay, this is the person that's sleeping, and they hear the voice that says, it's time to get up, and they ain't moving. So mom gently comes to the door and says, did you hear me? It's time to get up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two times, okay, but the third time... There's a shaking that happens. You get what I'm saying? Movers and shakers. You got to be shaken awake. But it's not enough to just be awake. You got to get up and start moving. It's interesting because I don't know about you. There's a lot of times that I just don't want to get up. I just don't. My flesh doesn't want to get up. But here's what's important to remember about this message this morning. We are a people that don't live by the flesh. We are led by the Spirit. That's what Romans 8.14 says. And because we live by the Spirit, then there's a reason to get up. I mean, because if I've been given another day, and I should rejoice in that day, that tells me that God is not done with me yet, and he's still on his throne, and he hasn't come back for me yet. So there must be still something for me to do in the will of God. But man, is it tough to get up sometimes. One of the things that Pastor Kevin has said before that always shakes me is in that moment between you're actually awake and your eyes open, is the Lord what you're thinking about. I mean, when your feet hit the floor, is it, thank you, Jesus, for another day? 
in that moment where your eyes have not yet opened, is he the one that's on your mind? I mean, that brings meditate on the word day and night to a whole new meaning. But to be led by the Spirit, Lord, I know my flesh does not want to get up right now, but I'm going to get up because you have something for me. It's time to get up. A little interesting fact for you, I know I've been throwing some of these out through the series, but did you know that the book of Isaiah is made up of 66 chapters? The book of the Bible is made up of 66 books. Isaiah is split into three parts. We've talked about those three parts, judgment, comfort, and hope. The Old Testament is 39 books. The New Testament is 27. But it's interesting because in Isaiah, it's broken in to kind of Old Testament, New Testament. Here's what I'm saying. There is 39 chapters in Isaiah that are dedicated to judgment, the law. Just like the Old Testament, the law is pointing to the need for a Messiah. But in the second part of Isaiah, it's pointing to a Messiah that would come. Interesting that the New Testament does the same. Just something to think about, just an interesting fact there, something that we covered last week, that there's a sign. There's, it's pointing to something deeper. You know, when we wake up, we all need something to wake up with Like someone wakes you up or an alarm clock, clock wakes you up. Isaiah, so to speak, gave the people, God's people, a wake-up call, an alarm clock. It's interesting because as we transition from, so to speak, the first 39 chapters of ju judgment and move into comfort, it starts in chapter 40 of Isaiah, and this is what Isaiah says. I hope that you'll see the tone of what he's saying here. Comfort, comfort my people. Not comfort here, comfort here. Comfort here for your inner being. And he says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. I hope you see this playing out, okay? Speak tenderly. It's time to get up. You get what I'm saying? Speak tenderly. It's time to get up. Tell her that her sad days are gone and that her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen. It's the voice of someone shouting. Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make straight the highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people see it together. The Lord has spoken. This is where it kind of turns up, because they aren't here, and they're not getting up, and it's time to get up. So the voice changes, and it says, a voice said, shout, shout. Shout what? Shout, get up. Tell, tell these people that they are like the grass, and their beauty will fade quickly, just as the flowers of the field. But here's the interesting part. All this points to something later on that happens in a couple verses later that says, the Lord is coming. That's what Isaiah was trying to say to these people. Gently say to them, but because they're not getting up, you need to shake them and say, Get up! The Lord's coming! Jesus is coming! The Lord is coming! And as he was waking them up, so to speak, there's always a shaking that happens. And here's the thing. It's not the shaking of man. It's the shaking of God. Another prophet speaks about this in the book of Haggai. You see that this is represented where the Lord says, Once again, I will shake both heaven and earth. And the people will know. But here's the interesting part about this passage in Isaiah and the passage in Haggai is that the shaking is a result of people being in captivity so that they could be set free. 
It's very interesting. But here's another thing that happens when it talks about the, the walk of faith and the responsibility that we have in Christ. It's said like this in, in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2 about the moving or the movers. It says, if you have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if you have faith that can move mountains but don't have love, you have nothing. You have nothing. Uh, here's what the Lord was speaking to me about that. Think about this. You can be moving earth and not impacting heaven. You can be literally moving earth but not impacting heaven. And now we spoke several weeks ago about there is a difference between being nice and being loving. I mean, if someone is about to jump out of a plane with a parachute on and you know the parachute is not on right and they ask you and you say, eh, you're good. You got it. Why would you do that? Well, I was just being nice. That's dangerous. So it's important that we know, right? Because if a new believer comes up to you and says, hey, is this wrong or right what, what I'm doing? And we say, eh, you're all right. I mean, we spoke about it last week. Out of the mouth comes death and life. So I should probably know if that's wrong or right, and I should probably be leaning into God because if I'm just moving earth, then I'm not impacting heaven. You know, another thing that's interesting when I think about my alarm clock going off, I don't know about you, but I don't like getting up. I just don't. Like I have to have a reason to get up, but here's the interesting part that I'm finding in the Lord, and, I, and I'll, I'll share my personal pain with you here. I feel that the Lord oftentimes will get my attention to let me know that something is about to happen, or something is about to change in my life, or something is, is going to be different than it once was. And I have a bad habit of doing this. Thank you, Lord. Let it be so. Send your blessing. Send your blessing. Send your blessing. But what my idea of his blessing looks like is a whole lot different than what he had in mind. Because about the time that I'm ready for it to happen, it, it happens, but it hits me somewhere else. And here's the thing that I'm finding, that, that growing in the Lord is painful. Yes, something is going to change about your life, but it's going to hurt a little bit. I mean, when does growing ever feel good? Like if you, ever, if you ever go to the gym and you're trying to go back to the gym and you start a new workout plan, like the first two weeks are miserable. Why? Because your body's not used to that. You're doing something new to your body. And it is uncomfortable, but we love the results of what hard work at the gym produces. I mean, here's another for instance. My daughter is about to start teething, and that is nothing desirable to watch your child go through, let alone your sleep depravity and all that other stuff. But here's the thing. What is coming into her mouth allows her to eat something that is more sustainable and profitable for her flesh, for her body. So growing never feels good, but there is something on the other side of growth. And I, I, I'm, I'm just sharing with you. I like, I, I, I like okay, God, send your blessing. Okay, I'm going to send your blessing, but you're going to learn something through this blessing. You'll be better because of it. It's going to be painful to go through, but I'm doing a great work in you. And I'll see it through. That's what his word says. I will see it through. Here's another great reason to get up. Isaiah 55. He is near. He is near. He is close. He's sitting right beside you. If you've made a decision to surrender your life to, to him, he not only is beside you, but he's also in you. But I love what Isaiah 55 says about this. Why should I get up? Here's a great reason to get up. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him because he is near, while he's near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish their very thoughts of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, 
for he will forgive generously. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Here's what I love about that. That's what the Lord is trying to teach me. I know that it seems like you're going through something right now, but don't forget that my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Would you just trust me? Would you just lean into me? I know this discipline may be painful, but it's going to produce fruit. Hmm. The rain and the snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Once Where there, where there once were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where there were nettles growing, myrtles will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. They will be an everlasting sign of his power and his love. Here's your sign. I don't know about you, but one of the things that I've been pondering this winter is it has been, it has rained more this winter than, than I can ever remember. But based on what the word says, that's to be a sign of what is to come. And I know that you may be going through a rough patch or in a season right now where you're feeling oppressed and things are coming against you. But what the Word says is the rain that's coming down is about to produce something much greater. It's about to sprout up where there were thorns, something that is fruitful will now appear. I don't know about you, but that's something to be excited about. Winter isn't always pleasant, but what it's producing, the rain that is coming down, is going to add value to what God is calling you to harvest. Hmm. There's another reason to get up. Those of us in the room, if you have chosen to give your life to Jesus Christ, and at the end of this service, I want to extend the opportunity, if you've not made that decision, to make that decision. To call Jesus your Lord and Savior. But those that have made that decision, it says in 1 Peter 2.9 that we are God's royal priesthood. We are his chosen people, his special possession, meaning that we bring light to the darkness. That we bring good news. I mean, that goes back to week two where we said calling has a cost. If God woke you up this morning... There's a chance that there are people he still wants you to reach for his, for his word, for his glory, for his kingdom. You're his chosen people, his possession. Hmm. It's interesting to me because in these things, in these times of awakening, shaking, shaking happens. A, a, a shaking happens. A stir happens. Would you, would you do this for me? Would you say, shake it off? Shake it off, yeah. There are some things in your life you need to shake off. But here's the thing. You don't have to do the shaking. It's already been done for you. You don't have to do it. I don't know about you, but there are some things when I wake up in the morning that I need to shake off myself. Like I got bad breath, I need to wash my face, I need to take a, 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 a shower. Like there's a process, right, to get the sleep off of you, to get the, the dead things off of you. But here's what's interesting about talking figuratively and talking literally about death here is that Jesus Christ went to the cross and when he released his spirit, when he spoke and said it is finished and gave his last breath, it says that the ground began to shake. The veil in the temple was torn and that the graves of the believers were opened up and they were raised from death to life. They were once asleep and now they are awake. And it says that they went to a people in the town and they were telling about what God had done. Death can't shake you. 
because of what Jesus has done for you. I asked this question two weeks ago at our discipleship class. Is death a non-issue for you? I had a 16-year-old young man. I put him on the spot. I said, is death a non-issue for you? And he said, yeah. I said, well, you're going to have to give me some, you have to give me a little more than that. And he said, I guess if the Lord calls me home, then that means it's my time and I've accomplished everything that he's wanted me to do. And somebody else in the class said, well, I guess we can just pray and go home now. A 16-year-old kid said, death is a non-issue for me because if Jesus has called me home, then it's my time to go and I've accomplished what he's wanted, wanted me to accomplish. I don't know about you, but I struggle with that. Because my argument with God is, well, Lord, I got a wife and a kid. And his question to me is, do you, you're saying you can take care of them better than I can? I mean, I'm just being real with you because we all have those conversations. But when death is shaken from you because of what Jesus has done, death really shouldn't be an issue. It really shouldn't be. But it's tough. There's another instance and I love this because <laughs> Paul and Silas are sitting in a prison. And the foundation begins to shake and the bars of the prison begin to shake as they're singing hymns and praying at midnight. And all of a sudden, the foundation breaks down and the bars fall off the prison and the chains that were on them fall off, it says. And they didn't move. When God shakes something up in your life, does it cause other people to hold in place? What does that even look like? Like when God is moving and you're surrendered to him and you know that his presence is evident, does it cause people to stop or do they just keep moving? Is a shaking in your life holding people in place because of the move of God, the shaking of God, is evident? I mean, that's crazy to me because it says that no one in the prison moved. And I'm guessing that they realized that there was something much greater in their presence than just songs and prayers. What about... When you're called to other people, what God calls you to share with other people, does it shake them? Not in a, not in a bad way, but it, does it cause them to stop and think? Do I really believe in this, this Jesus guy? Something to think about. It's very interesting because in the shaking, which is caused by God, there is then movement. It's where we become movers. Say this with me. Let's move. Let's move. We've got to move this morning. And that's why I'm saying getting up is so important. He causes the shaking. He woke you up for a reason. And he's calling you to move to something else. Here's what I love about the passage that we've already discussed about Jesus surrendering his spirit. All right? And those that were dead come alive. They moved to something. They moved to a people to share the truth of Jesus. It's difficult sometimes when we know we've been released from captivity. Because both of those passages uh, in, in Isaiah 40 and Haggai 2.6 are speaking about shaking, shakingness that was happening to release captives. Talking to the people of God who were in captivity. And the shaking happened... To indicate that things were going to change, change and people were going to be able to move from captivity to freedom. It's the same case with Jesus. When, when he said it's finished, the chains fall off. And that's what I'm saying in our lives this morning. There are some things that you've been battling and God has already allowed the shaking to occur. And you've been moved from death to life and you've now been released from the chains that once held you. And it's time to move. 
It is. It's time to move. And it's a beautiful movement. He's moving you towards destiny. I, I wrote that, that word on one of these slides, on the, uh, on the time to get up slide. And Sister Sarah shared that word with me Friday, the word destiny. And I think oftentimes when, you're really sur- when, we're, when we're surrendered to God and moving towards him, destiny is calling. Right? Destiny is calling. But as you move towards destiny, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. There'll be opposition by the enemy. When you're moving towards God, something will come against you. It's just, you, you, want, you want to know one of the greatest ways that I've learned to discern if I'm doing what God's asking me to do? Pastor James always told me this. Well, you better start worrying if there is no opposition, if there is no tension. When there is tension, you know that you're probably doing something for God. But destiny is calling. Purpose is calling. It's time to move towards that. Moving from death to life. Moving from captivity. That's why I say for those that that, that there will be an extension of salvation this morning. That you may surrender your life to Jesus. And by doing that, we're saying that literally the song that says death was arrested for you. So that you could be set free. You could be moved from captivity. It's not the most glamorous life. It's not just the promise of eternity. But there is a beautiful life in Jesus Christ. This is what I love about the other passage. Paul and Silas sit there. And a man is about to impale himself on his own sword. Right, so they're, they're singing and praising going on, on and the, the, the prison doors fall off, and, and, and it's just amazing, and everyone's kind of in place. But because of the shaking, the prison guard wakes up. And when he wakes up, he believes that everyone's gone. And he makes a, a move. Not really a response, but a reaction instead. See, because a response takes time. Thought. And he's about to impale himself on his own sword, and Paul says, We're all still here. And the man says, Would you all come and have dinner with me? And ask the question, What what is it that I have to do to have a relationship with this Jesus guy? And they say, Surrender your life. Believe in him. You and your family and serve him. And he does right there in that instance. But here's what I love about that passage. There was a shaking, and there was an opportunity to move from those prisons, those cells. But Paul and Silas didn't move. Instead, they were operating out of the Spirit of God and said, We'll move when you say move, Lord. I mean, that is tough. Because when things are going crazy we can oftentimes run towards craziness. And God is saying, no, would you just hold in place? I know there's a shaking. I know there's a move that I'm about to call you to. But would you just move when I tell you to move? I mean, that's that's tough. But there's beauty in that passage that they moved when God told them to move. And a man didn't impale himself. He was then saved and moved from death to life. Hmm. How many of you know as you're in the, so to speak, race of life, that it can get messy? Pastor James said to me before the service, I'm tired. I'm tired. We all get tired. We all get tired. And sometimes when we've woken up and we've moved into the field of battle, so to speak, and we're fighting the good fight, We get knocked down. And I just hear the Lord saying to all of us this morning, get up, shake it off, let's move. Right? I mean, because a kid that has the dirt of the world on him can still smile knowing that he's a child of God and the Lord will give him the strength to get up and keep moving. In case you needed scripture to confirm what I'm saying here, 
Finish where we started, Isaiah 40, 29 to 31. He gives power to the weak, strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on eagles' wings. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Here's what I love about that. I mean, when, we, when, when I think of moving, I think of moving in three distinct ways. Running, walking, crawling. That says you'll soar. I mean, that says you'll soar. But it's a moving from, I'm not leaning into my flesh... But I'm going to depend on the spirit of the living God, the one that said, there is rest. There is strength for me. I will soar on eagle's wings because I'm depending on God as my strength. God as my fortress, my stronghold versus the strongholds that come against me. We all get tired, but we can soar. We can soar, you know. You can soar. Mm. You can soar, brother. In Jesus' name, you can soar. There's rest, not in our flesh, but in Him. In Him. Three questions to finish. Are you up? Are you awake? Do you sit in here today knowing that death is a non-issue for you because you've given your life to Jesus Christ? If you've not made that decision, come. Let us pray with you. Give your life to Jesus. Second question. What do you need God to shake off of you? What chains have been broken that you continue to hold on to? That you can move out of? It's time to move. You don't have to stay there anymore. And if you're moving, are you moving towards God? Are you led by the Spirit? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you, God. We thank you for this word this morning. I thank you for those that are here this morning, God. I pray that you continue to move by your Spirit, that your will would be done in this response time. I pray that hearts are tender and ready to receive. Receive the freedom from captivity. The opportunity to say yes to you, Lord. And Lord, I know you were doing something in the response time last service. And I pray right now, Lord, that what you started, you would finish in this service. Allow it to continue. Allow it to grow and manifest, Lord. Allow it to be what you want it to be. That in your presence, we would decide to live for you, to stand for you, to move, to not be shaken by death, but to shake death from us. Holy Spirit, move. Move. Let your will be done, God. As we take in communion, we know, Jesus, that you made the move. You paid the price. You brought the gift of salvation through your sacrifice. Lord, I pray that everyone knows this morning that they they don't have to do anything or check off a a check box to, to, to receive your love and your free grace. They can simply say yes to you. There is no sin that you didn't die for. just coming to church is not enough, God. Father, we take of the communion, the bread, and the juice, the representation of your blood, to say that we have part with you. We have relationship with you. 
we all say yes to you today, God. May our hearts be surrendered. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Respond as you feel led.